Vertigo Myth Central versus peripheral tables help you make the diagnosis in vertigo patients. But if it's a myth and we shouldn't use them, what can we use? Hi, Peter Johns here, emergency physician and vertigo enthusiast working in Ottawa, Canada. Most healthcare professionals are not vertigo dedicated clinicians, so they are usually only willing to devote a small amount of their personal bandwidth to learning about the assessment of the dizzy patient. For that reason, I think it's important not to clutter up the mind of vertigo learners with concepts that aren't helpful. And the first one I think that needs to go in the trash bin is the old characteristics of central versus peripheral vertigo table. Now I'm not talking about the concept that vertigo can be divided up into central and peripheral causes. This is certainly true and a useful thing to know. In fact, I authored my own table of central and peripheral causes in the current edition of Tintinelli's Emergency Medicine Textbook. Nor am I talking about tables that outline the HINTS exam like this one, which correctly state at the top that it should only be applied to the subset of patients with vertigo that have the acute vestibular syndrome, that is, ongoing persistent vertigo for hours or days, and most importantly, nystagmus. HINTS should not be applied to those whose symptoms have now resolved or patients who don't have spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus. What I'm talking about is the diagnostic approach to the undifferentiated vertigo patient that tries to use a dichotomous table of the characteristics of central and peripheral vertigo to aid in diagnosis. A quick Google search turns up what I'm suggesting you erase from your vertigo memory banks to free up some space. Unfortunately, these types of tables have been a staple in emergency medicine textbooks for decades and can still be found on many online resources as you can see. There are dozens of these tables, each one almost always differing in some way from the others. I'll give the short answer now. These sorts of tables are doomed to failure because the undifferentiated vertigo patient includes BPBV and vestibular neuritis on the peripheral side and cerebellar stroke on the central side. And the classic presentation of BPBV and vestibular neuritis are actually quite different from each other. And cerebellar stroke can present so similar to vestibular neuritis that vertigo specialists had to come up with a HINTS exam to tell them apart. So how can you design a useful central versus peripheral table given these facts? As I'll show you, you really can't. These tables aren't helpful, and in most cases are misleading. So I suggest you use my Big 3 of Vertigo approach instead. There's a link on your screen for my video about it, and in the video description below, I'll put the link for my recent CMAJ article about it. Some personal background about this issue. When I started getting more serious about getting more involved in Vertigo education in 2015, I looked hard at these various central versus peripheral tables, and seeing their flaws, I tried to make a generalized approach to vertigo using a central versus peripheral table, and I soon realized it couldn't be done. So I devised my own approach, the Big Three approach. In 2016, I gave my first international lecture about my approach to vertigo in Cardiff, Wales, at their beautiful city hall, and included was a slide that showed how an emergency medicine textbook had a central versus peripheral table that was not helpful. Feedback from one of the conference organizers was that I shouldn't be too critical of the central versus peripheral table approach because a lot of people felt it was a useful paradigm. I took that advice to heart and have been kept pretty quiet about it since. Now more than four years later, as these tables continue to be published in major textbooks and online tutorials, I finally decided to explain why I think they're brain-cluttering misinformation and how they're hindering the proper assessment of the undifferentiated patient with vertigo. I don't know who made these first central versus peripheral table, but here are three such general vertigo approach tables. The earliest one I could find, which is from the first edition of Rosen's emergency textbook, and then one from the current edition of Rosen's, and one that was posted online in a YouTube lecture in the past year whose target audience was emergency physicians. So what did the authors of these tables think they were doing by making them? I imagine they thought that by looking at which side of the table your vertigo patient mostly fits in, you can determine if they had a central or peripheral cause for their vertigo, and this would help guide you in further assessment, disposition, and treatment. The cynic in me wonders if they're so popular because they can be easily turned into an exam question for learners. Please write down the characteristics of central vertigo versus peripheral vertigo, two points for each correct answer. Sadly, few of the answers would be factually correct. So why don't they work? First of all, Obviously, no central versus peripheral table will be able to properly assign all cause of vertigo to one of these categories. So how could it work in theory? Well, if you had disease A and disease B on the peripheral side, they'd have to have many features in common. And if you had disease C on the central side, then it should not have any features in common with disease A or disease B. So which diagnoses should be covered? It should cover what I term the big three, which are BPBV, vestibular neuritis, 
and posterior circulation stroke syndromes, which include thrombotic, hemorrhagic, and TIA. BPBV is the most common and curable cause of vertigo. Vestibular neuritis is the most common cause of vertigo seen in the emergency department that presents with spontaneous nystagmus. And posterior circulation stroke is of course the most feared cause of vertigo because if you miss them, the patient may have a bad outcome, including death. But in fact, most posterior cir circulation stroke syndromes have other neurologic features that would differentiate them from BPBV and vestibular neuritis. So let's look at a bare bones central versus peripheral table and see how that would work with these three essential diagnoses. BPBV and vestibular neuritis obviously go on the peripheral side. So are they quite similar in their pl clinical presentation? No, in fact, they're quite different. The most common form of BPBV, posterior canal BPBV, has vertical upward rotary nystagmus only seen during the dix hall pike test, and it generally lasts 20 or 30 seconds. And vestibular neuritis has horizontal rotatory nystagmus, which is constant for the first few days. Now, what about posterior circulation stroke? Does it present quite differently than vestibular neuritis? No, in fact, it could present very similar to vestibular neuritis. That's what the vertigo specialist called pseudo-vestibular neuritis. And that's why Kata and David Newman Toker developed the HINTS exam to distinguish between vestibular neuritis and pseudo-vestibular neuritis, which is actually a stroke. And that's where the value of HINTS really is for emergency physicians to reliably rule in vestibular neuritis and thus rule out stroke so you can send home vestibular neuritis patients safely. The first table we'll look at is the one from the first edition of Rosen's Emergency Medicine Textbook that was published in 1983 and the table that I studied when I became a practicing emergency physician in 1985. That vertigo chapter is also part of the reason why, like most emergency physicians, I learned to dislike vertigo. It only changed when I realized much of the information in that textbook was wrong. Let's see if it has any useful information to guide us in assessing the vertigo patient. I'll start at the top and work my way down. If you want a reference for the answers I'm giving, the best one is probably the 23-page review article by Taunitzer and David Newman Toger in the CMAJ entitled, Does My Dizzy Patient Have a Stroke? I'll put a link to it in the video description. First of all, onset. Gradual in central? Nope. Posterior circulation strokes on the right-hand side most often come on suddenly. And vestibular neuritis on the left side, which is uh, the diagnosis that always worries us, worries us if it could be a stroke, can come on suddenly or have a stuttering start. So this part is dangerously wrong. Type of episodes. The intense vertigo in BPBV is intermittent, lasting roughly 20-30 seconds or so, but the patients with vestibular neuritis, also on the peripheral side, have constant vertigo for days. And on the central side, posterior circulation TIA, although fairly rare, is not continuous. Dangerously wrong again. Next one, duration. How is saying the duration of peripheral vertigo can be seconds, minutes, hours, or days helpful in any way? And posterior circulation TIA can last minutes, and stroke can last hours to many days, so again, not helpful. Quality of vertigo. The quality or intensity of the vertigo is not something you can use to discriminate central versus peripheral vertigo. There may be some general trends that cerebellar strokes complain less about vertigo, but it's not helpful to evaluate an individual patient. Effective head position. Since certain head movements initiate BPBV and worsens both vestibular neuritis and posterior circulation stroke, how is this helpful? It's not. Associated hearing loss. Most central and peripheral causes of vertigo don't have hearing loss, but in fact they can rarely be present in peripheral causes such as labyrinthitis and Meniere's disease, which are both much less common than BPBV and vestibular neuritis. And unfortunately, hearing loss can occur in central causes, such as an ICA stroke, an anterior inferior cerebellar artery stroke, which is why a bedside test of hearing was added to HINTS to make it HINTS plus. So hearing loss doesn't rule out stroke at all. Positional nystagmus. I assume they're referring to the dix hall pike test. It is true that posterior canal BPBV usually has a few seconds of latency where the patient doesn't have any vertigo when first placed in the dix hall pike position and then develops nystagmus and vertigo, but the rest of it is just a terrible description of what a positive dix hall pike test might look like. And fatigability should not be tested anymore. If it's classic positive dix hall pike, you should go straight into an Epley maneuver. Spontaneous nystagmus. Okay, spontaneous vertical nystagmus is not peripheral, I grant you that. 
Removal of visual fixation is rarely used by emergency physicians, but okay, sure. What do they mean by uh, bilateral or unilateral? I don't even know. If they mean peripheral nystagmus changes direction with gaze, well, that's wrong. And spontaneous nystagmus is not necessarily associated with peripheral vertigo, but it is with central vertigo. Maybe a typo here. Just a mess of information that only served to confuse. Caloric induced nystagmus. I'm not sure there's an emergency physician in the history of the world that ever tested a patient with calorics. And now it's pretty much obsolete even for vertigo experts. Neurologic examination. We had to wade through a lot of nonsense for a nugget of half-truth. Patients with peripheral vertigo should not have any new neurologic deficits, yes. But the whole reason we have hints is to catch the subtle posterior circulation stroke that you can't find neurologic deficits on exam except for a hints central finding. So again, this is misleading you into missing a stroke. Overall, this table gets an F, but of course it was written over 38 years ago. So how far have we come in the intervening decades? Let's check Rosen's current edition, the ninth, published in 2018. It's still a central versus peripheral dichotomous table with the divergent clinical characteristics of BPBV and vestibular neuritis jammed into the peripheral side. Frankly, a weak start with onset. As I said when discussing the first edition table, vestibular neuritis can have a stuttering start. And I'm not sure how saying central vertigo can be sudden or gradual is helping us. Intensity. On the peripheral side, in BPBV, it's intense for 20 seconds or so. Is that what they're referring to? Or vestibular neuritis that generally is intense for one or two days and slowly gets better? And in central, since most cause of central vertigo is posterior circulation stroke, how is it mild in most but can be severe in stroke? Just not useful information. Duration. So I guess it's good that they describe the typical duration of BPBV and vestibular neuritis, but how does this help when central causes are described with the same duration parameters? The direction of the stigmas. Same with this. Gets points for describing the nystagmus for both posterior and horizontal canal BPBV as well as vestibular neuritis, but it should describe it as vertical upwards rather than upbeat. Because if there's one thing people seem to remember about vertigo is that vertical nystagmus is bad, when in fact vertical upward nystagmus is often seen in posterior canal BPBV and so not bad. So call it vertical upward because that's what it is. Also loses points for not stating that posterior circulation stroke can have nystagmus, which is identical to the typical nystagmus seen in vestibular neuritis, as in this patient with a brainstem stroke. His nystagmus gets worse when he looks to the left and goes away when he looks to the right. This would be a common finding in a patient with a right vestibular neuritis, but that's why Hintz has three components and not just one. He had diplopia and abnormal vertical skew, so he's picked up by screening for central features and by the Hintz exam. Effective head position. Here it would be so much easier to just state that both vestibular neuritis and posterior circulation stroke can worsen with head movement in contrast to BPBV where it initiates the vertigo of BPBV. With both BPBV and vestibular neuritis being on the same side of the table, this just becomes awkward. Associated neurologic findings. Okay, a nugget of gold that's usually true, but because it isn't always true, we need hints to rule out stroke in vestibular neuritis. Associated auditory findings. Oddly, this suggests that tinnitus is not present in labyrinthitis and hearing loss is not present in Meniere's disease, which is not true. And the rarely, on the central side, could have just had the words seen in ICA stroke added to make sense of why it can be seen in central causes. So overall, a D-. Many of the characteristics are non-discriminators between central and peripheral cause of vertigo. There are some true facts sprinkled around in it, but it's too many jumbled up facts to assist you on how to assess your patient with undifferentiated vertigo. Poor emergency medicine residents shouldn't have to try and memorize this table for their final exams when they could be memorizing things that could actually help them make a diagnosis. Here's the last central versus peripheral table I'll show you. It was uploaded to YouTube as part of an ENT review for emergency physicians in the past year. Now that you've seen what I've said about the other central versus peripheral tables, you can figure out for yourself pretty fast that this is not going to be a useful table, except perhaps the last row, which says that neurologic symptoms aren't present in peripheral causes and are usually present in central ones. What's sad about this table is that it's presented by someone who touts himself as a skeptical emergency physician, but reads off this table like it's gospel, and also describes the Dix-Hall-Pike test and the nystagmusina BPBV incorrectly, and also suggests that you can kill someone by doing the Hintz exam 
which is nonsense. So what's the final verdict on whether these tables are useful to help you assess the undifferentiated vertigo patient? I think the answer is no on all counts. In this study by Kerber, where they interviewed emergency physicians about their experiences with BPBV, one physician, who is described at an expert level of ability, complained that the errors in emergency medicine textbooks lies mostly in trying to lump BPBV with other peripheral vertigo disorders. Well, exactly. Trying to show how similar BPBV is to vestibular neuritis is like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. So I promised an alternative approach. Well, what would happen if instead of separating everything into central and peripheral, we separated them into conditions that cause short episodes versus long episodes? Then our big three would look like this. Then remember that one thing I found in all three of the tables that was useful is that in peripheral causes, you wouldn't expect additional neurologic symptoms or findings, and with central causes, they often do occur, but not always. So if we layer that on top of our short versus long episode breakdown, we get something that looks like this, and then apply the appropriate bedside testing on the short episodes, the Dix-Halpike test, and the HINTS exam on those with persistent vertigo and nystagmus, and fill in a few details about those bedside tests, and you have my big three of vertigo algorithm. If you want to have more detail on how to use this algorithm, see my big three of vertigo video. You know, Max Planck, the theoretical physicist who won the Nobel Prize, was paraphrased as saying, science progresses one funeral at a time. Vertigo is hard enough for vertigo novices to understand when the ways to di diagnose patients are clearly presented. Why do we persist in propagating misinformation just because it's a nice little chart that's been around for decades? Maybe it's time to put the central versus peripheral table to rest, at least as it pertains to the undifferentiated vertigo patient, and try something that leads you clearly to the three most common and important diagnoses. As usual, thanks for watching, and I hope you're all safe out there, and I know we all hope for a better year to come.